Hi, welcome to our webinar. Today is Digital Democracy and Sovereignty, which is the fourth in our Decolonizing Digital Strategies series, Salon series. And so welcome everyone who's coming to us from around the world. Uh, we are in different locations and I wanna acknowledge, first of all, that I'm coming to you from the unceded and stolen lands of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I believe our guests today are all in the Toronto area, which is in the Haudenosaunee, Ashinana, Benakbaki and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, and now that I've said what's come to be very common in these uh, type of events, I wanna just unpick a little bit the whole idea of land acknowledgement in the kind of moment we're in right now. Uh, our Salon series has been is around decolonizing. And while today's specific webinar is focusing on um, the, the folks at Tech Reset Canada, who I'll introduce shortly, um, we want to sort of note that at this moment in time, like when we planned this webinar, we didn't know that the country was going to be in the conversation that it's in now. And I wanted to sort of preface it with, with uh, the fact that the discovery of what is now, I think, over over 15, or it's about, I think it's over 1,300 graves that have been discovered in various locations, including the Kawasas First Nation of Saskatchewan most recently. And these are really um, shocking to a lot of people, but not shocking to those who have been hearing the stories from First Nations people about this for years on end. So when I when I heard the the news of the first discovery in Kamloops, I had a real gut reaction, and it wasn't the same as as just shock that this had happened. It was more now the reckoning is coming. Now we can start talking about the truth instead of just lip service to reconciliation. And I wanted to just say that as we begin this, because our whole series has been really looking looking at these issues overall, even though we are talking about marketing, even though we are talking about digital strategy, and even though we are promoting projects and campaigns, it's really important to sort of look at where we're situated at, in the moment and, and geographically. And so the, the fact is, is that uh, non-Indigenous people in this country do need to come to terms with uh, what is happening and that it, it's not so much that this wasn't being told because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission told us over, I think it was six years ago, uh, about the numbers of these missing children in residential schools. So I just wanted to, to point out too that um, a couple of our colleagues, including Lena Minifi, who belongs to the Kikatla Nation, who's one of the partners in Cool World. She was on Canada Land recently, and a, a quote that she made there was, as Indigenous people, we should not have to investigate our own genocide. That really struck with me, because to me, that is a call and a challenge to those of us who are not Indigenous to uh, really take some concrete steps. And while this isn't the topic of our webinar today, it will, of course, be the topic of many of our tweets and social media um, posts in the coming days, weeks, as this becomes a conversation across the country that's not going away, especially given tomorrow's date of July 1st. So I would like to encourage people who are um, you know, taking the holiday tomorrow to think again about what celebrations mean in the context of this moment and to do what the chief from the Kawasas First Nation suggested. And maybe if you have not already, take a look at the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. Take a look at the recent report from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Take some time tomorrow to read those things and think about what you're, you're going to do. And then, um, and again, I'll, I'll post some of these things across social media over the next few days, but there's been other specific actions that many people have suggested that allies can take part in. And those would include, you know, contributing to the, um, the residential school survivor society. That's a good place to start. And there is also, um, 
very there's an event going on today through the Cheney Wenjack Society, which is looking which is radio stations across the country are participating in a, a listening day around all of this. So I'm sure there's going to be many suggestions of what you could specifically do. And then in terms of calls to action, uh, which is another one that the chief from Cowes has suggested, is it's really time to tell the Catholic Church to release the residential school records and apologize. I think it's long overdue. And if you do nothing else to take action as an ally in this cause, phone the prime minister and say, you know, release the records. Every residential school in this country is actually a crime scene. And uh, I'll take that opportunity to quote another colleague of mine who is Indigenous, Jada Gabrielle Pape from the Hosset, which is the name of nations. And she was saying, if these were, uh, and this is quoting from her Instagram, white people, save your thoughts and prayers, save your confusion. If these were mass murder graves of white bodies, you'd know exactly what to do. So do it. And that's just my, my one thought at the beginning of all this. Um, and I know this is a heavy topic to begin with, and, and, and I know it's also not the whole subject of what we're talking about, but I do think that uh, the decolonizing theme is writ large across our series, and so it just had to be said given this moment. Um, that being said, um, we have had, this is the fourth in our series of webinars. Today we are talking about um, digital democracy and sovereignty. And I'm going to take this opportunity now to introduce you to cool world partner, friend, and amazing all around person, Jen Evans, who is also one of the co-founders of Tech Reset Canada, and of course, CEO of Squeeze CMM. And she will introduce the topic of the webinar today and take it from there. Thank you so much, Kat. And thank you for those eloquent words about the moment that we're in, and in particular, the time that we're in Canada. I think actually there was another discovery, uh, if I'm not mistaken, today. So this is something that we're obviously going to see continue for months and years. And to use your language, there is a, a reckoning coming. And uh, thank you for that counsel around the types of actions that uh, we can take to be good allies, given um, everything that is happening. It is heartrending to witness. So. Um, as, I, as Kat mentioned, my name is Jen Evans. I'm a partner in Tech Reset Canada and in Cool World. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here today with two of my colleagues in Tech Reset Canada, uh, Sadia Muzaffar and Bianca Wiley. And uh, I'm particularly happy to uh, be speaking with them both today about digital democracy and sovereignty uh, because we have not seen each other in pretty much since the start of the pandemic. In fact, we have not seen each other since the start of the pandemic um, and have barely spoken. And so much has happened. Uh, so much happened immediately preceding the start of the pandemic um, that Tech Reset Canada was involved in. So I really just want to start, first of all, um, by saying, how are you both doing? Where are your heads at right now? Before we get into the meat of the conversation, um, I don't know if it's possible to bring them both up on screen, but here we have them. So Bianca Wiley and Sadia Muzaffar, how are you both at this particular June 30th, a pretty big day in, in the history of the past couple of years? I can begin. Uh, thank you for having us. It's just such a pleasure to, to be together. You know, whatever together means these days, it keeps changing on us. Um, I am on day two of having received my vaccination. So mm -hmm. I am grateful and a little sore. Um, I'm grateful that our public health system is doing, you know, perhaps not in the best supported way but when you when you go to these places you really realize how public infrastructure matters right like this clinic that i went to um was going to do ten thousand doses yesterday mm -hmm. and they took over an entire mall malls that have closed in the pandemic and mm -hmm. That's an undertaking, you know, and things were really thoughtful where we were waiting for our 15 minutes after getting the dose. There was like art from local artists. So you, you had something to stare at, you know, mm -hmm. little things like that, just reminders of when we put thoughtfulness into our actions with each other and when our systems, you know, work the way that they ought to, um, it makes our life together 
much, much better than what it, what it is when that's not the case. So that's on my mind a lot right now, other than what Kat and yourself um, raised. I'm thinking a lot about those things and how they're connected. And how they're connected. And there's a certain irony in the fact that um, you know, the main vehicle of information for a lot of people throughout this vaccination process has been a non-sanctioned Twitter account. <laughs> um, and that really speaks a lot, I think, to some of the things that we were originally planning to talk about today. And we can get into that into a bit. But first of all, Bianca, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks for, you know, convening the space for us to have a conversation. I'm... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty ragged, you know, I think, uh, and I've, I've been explicit in saying that when we have conversations like this, I think, you know, I'm, have had some over the course of this pandemic, um, but also building on what all of you have shared, uh, since we opened this up, um, is trying to see the long arc of time and work and the sort of, um, what actions everybody can take from where they are in so many different spaces uh, in terms of how we have our infrastructures, our services, our systems to support each other, you know, like how how do we, you know, because you can feel things failing, but they're not failing because they weren't failing before the pandemic. Right. And, you know, and so I think it's, it's uh, I guess, a lot of thoughts about continuity and um, maybe because of the technology piece, the sort of which things that were, worrisome before the pandemic are only accelerating, you know, like which power is very safe in this moment. And um, yeah, those those are the kinds of themes. But I think, you know, on a personal level, like all right. Um, and also like a, a, a lesson that I haven't, you know, I've kind of come through this time is, is slowing down and how hard it is sometimes to slow down. Um, that's, that's real for me um, has been a change, but both welcome and unwelcome, I think in some things, especially in all the work that we do, it uh, trying to do it in these in this context right now of not being together. Um, you know, political work when you can't easily meet up in person uh, takes on a whole, you know, a, a whole new a whole new piece. Um, so yeah, so those are my, my where I'm at in this exact moment, kind of, th there's more, but I'll stop there. How about you, Jen? Uh, I, I'm hanging in there. It's, uh, it's been a rough couple of weeks. Um, the, uh, as you both know, and, and uh, I'm sure folks who are um, participating in this may be aware, I've been quite involved in what's happening in the homeless situation in the city. And uh, the recent events in Trinity Bellwoods Park have been very traumatizing, I think is probably a good word to describe how it, the impact on, on the, the community of people who are unhoused. Um, but I also think there's been a kind of psychological trauma that has been um, perpetrated on the city in, in a way that I think we're only really starting to understand. I think in the middle of the pandemic and the sense of isolation, seeing these images of violence, it was very, very disturbing. Um, and to actually have been there and experiencing it uh, just that much more so. And to see sort of the arbitrary use of power um, at a time when people are so vulnerable and so uncertain about what's coming next mm. uh, was frankly kind of terrifying given the context that we're in and some of the things that we're talking about, um, particularly related to the city and some of the decisions that are being made around technologies, basically what we were initially coming here to talk about. Um, power is uh, is accelerating, uh, to use your word right now, it feels like. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, one one thing that I, I think to, to try to tie a bit of a line to even what some of Kat has said, and I know what you've been doing in this series, um, talking about decolonizing um, and sovereignty is um, thinking about power and how we can define uh, you know, the, the rules and the policies and all of the ways in which we live together, right? And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that may not be super intuitive, but one of the things I've always been trying to work through um, is when what was formerly public, and let's talk, you know, the state, when we talk about sovereignty, we often think about the state uh, mm -hmm. or states or nation states. Um, one of the things that's happening now through technology uh, is just increasing privatization. 
Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I just wanted to offer up in terms of power and, and, and topically is that uh, some of the work that we've done together even has been trying to um, fight privatization of what was formerly or, or is generally understood as either public, you know, like something of the public domain, whether it's how our public spaces are seen or how our public policy is created. And the state is not a defensible entity. You know, it's not like if you say private or public, it's like rah, rah government, like it's really an indefensible and violent state. But through this state, should we want to engage properly in nation to nation to nation relations and reconciliation activity, um, we can only do that if we retain public power. You cannot do that through private interest. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one way to maybe consider sometimes when people think about technology policy and technology infrastructure and they think, well, that's like a, if it's a private public thing, what does that have to do with, you know, sovereignty or reconciliation? There is actually a way to connect all of those dots together. And I think that's that's just one thing I wanted to offer up um, as something, you know, sometimes people might work in technology policy and think, oh, I'm not sure what my role is in some of this. And it's like, well, there's actually a lot. There's a lot to right. say about retaining power so that you can set up um, different infrastructures, even within different, you know, nation to nation to nation setup within so-called Canada. So that's that, that's one thing that uh, that I wanted to maybe just, just 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 share because sometimes these things that seem like they're not related, you act, you, you just have to find your path to how they are related. And, and there's a lot of that, um, I think, in all of these topics. I don't know, Sadia, if you wanna you know, come in on, I know we've been talking a lot about the, what the relationship is, you know, between the state and the people and, and how yeah. those things together. That might not be the, the path to go down, but that was one thing I was thinking about. No, I, I think that the thing is there is no one path, right? And that's really mm -hmm. important to recognize the plurality of like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about how the language that we use um, to talk to each other about this um, needs to evolve to a place where more of us can come into the tent. So I've been thinking about how could we talk about, and this is this is not mine, I'm reading up on it, uh, privatization, right? Like, the, the, I don't know how people understand that. It's like democracy. Like, I, how mm -hmm. do people understand that as, as a structure? And right. I've been thinking about the word enclosure, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of things that um, are supposed to be the commons, like things that we share with each other, public spaces is, is supposed to be a commons. Trinity Bellwoods is a public space. That's, that's a shared space. Um, Enclosure is anything that that takes it away from you know access by most people, mm -hmm. by by the public, by just anybody, right? Mm -hmm. And the link between that and literally what tech companies are building and pitching right now is so crystal clear right now. Mm -hmm. With you know, you can call it surveillance, you can call it securitization, you can call it you know, the, the influence of military and defense tactics on what is being pitched? Yeah, it's, sorry to interrupt, but I was just gonna say, it, it, there's this invisible layer and, and it is invisible to anybody who is not in the industry, who doesn't understand how these decisions are made and the implications of a major software platform being rolled out in government, in the private sector, I mean, we, we have no idea what happens once something like that occurs. Um, sorry, I interrupted. Please continue. But I think that say, was just say more about what you, you were saying. Okay, give me an example of where, where your mind was going with that. Sure. So uh, let's let's look at example. For example, you know, uh, something that Bianca has been working on the, the pay it deal. Um, we have no idea what the implications of that deal could possibly be for people in poverty, for people who are not necessarily part of the mainstream, who are not, uh, who are using cash for the majority of the ways that they manage their bills, etc. cetera. Um, so there, there's a layer of implications across all of that that are not going to be visible until something like that is actually rolled out. It's just the way that it works. And we all know Mark Richardson and people like Mark Richardson who will say, well, okay, it's not the perfect solution, but it's a hell of a lot better than technology that's 15 years old that doesn't even serve the purposes that we need it to anymore. That is a very interesting conversation at this point in time. I'd love to hear what both of you have to, to think. I know we all know Mark and people like him. Um, where, where does that kind of decision come in at the point in time that we're in? Well, 
Yeah, I think one um, one thing that's uh, germane to this moment is, you know, thinking about, uh, I don't know if people have heard, vac like digital passports for vaccination mm -hmm. or digital identity, right? Those are two cases. When you mentioned pay it, you know, that's just in the shortest form, um, making it so people can pay things easily online. Um, and I think in all of those circumstances, the difference between like a, a paper record mm -hmm. and a digital record um, you know, there's so many, you know, there's just so many implications to that. But like one of the ones that uh, I think we've all been learning about through time is access to your rights when those things don't work the way they're supposed exactly. to or the, or the way that they have been sold. And I think um, in terms of like Tech Reset Canada's work, what the three of us, you know, work on and try to intervene in cases where we see, uh, you know, public, whether that's government or non-government, but a lot of government use of technology and their policies and how does that impact the public good? So, you know, uh, uh, within the work that we've done together, that's meant um, showing up when governments are doing things like purchasing or procurement or they want to have a new policy and asking questions to say, okay, well, hold on. So you're outsourcing um, this, let's use the paid example. When someone has a problem, paying a bill instead of being in touch with the city of toronto and the public service their first layer of support or the first person they're they're making a call into is a private company a private vendor yeah right and so shifting what a public service is and does and how much that connection between government and people matters and we need to strengthen it for it to you know get better mm -hmm. um that very important relationship being pushed out and then governments very happily thinking that they can outsource their risk. And they say things like that. They're like, oh, we're outsourcing this. I'm like, you can't outsource democratic accountability. And they all know this. Yeah. And I think just, I'll, I'll stop at this point, but one of the things that um, is an important piece of history, you know, when I was speaking earlier about the, this long arc of time, just one thing I want to share with everyone who thinks about technology policy and governments is that when IT was, you know, <laughs> say in the 80s and 90s, IT was full of people who were making sure that your computer's email was working, that you had a security patch. Mm -hmm. And nothing has changed except suddenly you've got people in government IT that are now purchasing systems that have to do with like access to health information. Like there is, yeah. there has been a major shift in what IT does and how it's understood in government. Yeah. And along those years, very, very heavy privatization, lots of management consultants, lots of outsourcing, lots of outsourcing, lots of outsourcing. So um, we're in this really bad moment in time where not only is the private sector seeing this as a surface area for profit, because you think about in this moment, they're scaring people to say, your government can't do this, we got to do this. Mm -hmm. And the government is showing up and saying, yeah, perfect, you do it. So they're, 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 they're like this in a way that really puts all of us who aren't in either of those places uh, we, we are not represented. We are quite vulnerable to that kind of power right now. I think it really speaks to a conversation that three of us had probably a couple of years ago now, um, which really was an eye opener for me uh, because working in tech for so long, the, the thing that you're so often in search of is efficiency. And I remember Sadia looking at me at one point going, efficiency is a terrible word. It is not what we should be looking for. Efficient systems are not human-centered systems. And we have to put people at the center and at the heart of what we're doing. And if we're offloading these types of things in sort of a US or Thatcher-esque kind of model, we've already seen what the implications of that are. Why are we even thinking about doing this again? Saadi, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. I'm going to share something. I realized that of the last three events that I've done, they've all been Wednesdays and they've all been garbage days and the garbage truck is outside. So if you can hear this, it's just I funny can. to me. Um, I do have a cat and a dog in the background though. Okay. I just wanted to say, I like, can wow. make noise. If, if you need me to crunch something, I can open something with an aluminum foil. Or... I hope people can tell what a great team we make when we come together. It's really joyous. Um, I think that the discussion about efficiency is overblown in a way that communications, as an example, is overblown in, in tech circles, right? Like in, in so much of the, specifically the software and hardware related discussions now to do with algorithms, et cetera, is like, if there's a problem, they're like, oh, 
if if there's a problem, it's because there isn't, you know, timely communication between people. And let's fix that. That's always only a part of what needs fixing. But because tech is really good at comms, yeah, it's like a hammer and nail situation. Everything is a nail Absolutely. to us, right? Yeah. So efficiency is one of those things. And then I think we hide behind a lot of this. And it's particularly I don't use this word lightly, but it's particularly weaponized when it comes to government decisions, right? Because we have this, um, there's a word for this. There is like a managerial sort of ethos that a government should be run like a business when the two things are very, very different in what they ought to be doing. One is supposed to be um, a stewardship role, right? And one is supposed to generate profit. Those two can never be the same. Um, and I hope that the pandemic, I, I mean, I pray to God that the pandemic has made that absolutely clear and obvious to people. But uh, as days go on, <laughs> start to question whether that's actually happened or not. It should be patently obvious to people at this point. Um, but well, it seems like there's some. But, but I think, no, I think, unfortunately, what happens is what always happens is after the privatization fails, you say, see, the government's not working. We need to privatize more. Like it, it's an accelerant, right? Yeah. And I think. Um, to build on on both your points on efficiency, like this is a really good one that goes back to sovereignty and democracy as well, which is like democracy is the opposite of efficient. Like the whole benefit of democracy is that it's messy and it requires a whole lot of inefficient conversation. And I think that when we think about things like treaty obligations, being in good relationships with each other, these are very non, these are very like human and relationship centric uh, undertakings that require, and I think this is where holding these things up against uh, classical democracy models is really important where, mm -hmm. you know, in our legislation, you, you do something every five years, you take a review, you see how it's impacting people working, not whatever. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is not nearly iterative enough. And to Sadia's earlier point about like the commons and the sort of alternative models where we're moving from, if we're going to get into, you know, at the heart of a lot of the problems, whether people are talking about, you know, they want to talk about capitalism or um, different political systems, whatever, we're really talking about ownership um, yeah. as a concept and, and yeah. property, private property as a concept. And moving right. from ownership to stewardship, to build again on what Sadi was speaking on on this point, um, requires yeah. that we have good models of governance amongst, you know, mm -hmm. within and that it's like democracy between elections and how are we doing the work every day, every day, coming back to each other, coming back to each other. So I'm finding in this moment that we've been bad at that. I mean, the, the, the we there needs to be tempered. Some people are not bad at that. Some people are terrible at that. And in the liberal, liberal democratic model, we are getting worse and worse and worse at, uh, you know, being in community with people with whom we disagree. Right. And this is where technology is also being a really bad accelerant. And that yeah. sort of binary, that computer mode of like this or this or this or this yeah. and that efficiency, yeah. it's it's exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing more of. And I think it's, it's hard when the work that we need to do is relationship work. It's like act right. right, be in good relationships with other people. Right. Like how how do you how do you right? Like like people want technical solutions, and we're and we're really in a point in time where it's like this is this is not you're not going to find them there. We know this, right. um, but then also to Sadia's point on communications, it is incredible how, and in the work even that the three of us were doing a few years ago, how much of that played out in communications, in rhetoric, in public relations, in media, in language that no one feels like they own anymore. Even the word democracy, what the hell does that mean to each of us, yeah. right? Like some people hear democracy, they're like, yeah, no, thank you. Like, yeah. look at my life in a democracy. Like I'm I'm not really feeling it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot flying around in there, but I, I do have a thing I wanna talk about with, with, with communications and public relations. And I don't know if you saw Amazon trying to file a complaint today that Lena Khan, who's the chair of the FTC, uh, has already done too much work that would say that she oh, against Amazon and yeah. the, and so they're filing right and so and and so the thing they're filing they're, they're saying she, it's not fair that she would come in on our case of monopoly she she has this long track record of of being critical about us and it's one of those ones where you stop and you go even if that case is not successful they've planted that PR seed 
right? Yeah. Like now, now, now they've just, so it's like watching politics play out through communications yeah. is really a challenge for grassroots organizations. Because once it's in the headlines and major newspapers and this stuff flies around, I felt particular, I mean, I can share that as a personal experience. What are you supposed to do with that? Losing the story, you know, losing yeah. the story and people knowing that they're playing this out through comms, like that power of tech and comms, just side of your point, that just hit me off because this morning when I saw it, I was like, of course, yeah. of course, this is how this is going to start, right? Like you, you, you can't be on, like, I'm going to come out preempt and, and, and get into, I'm going to set a narrative as, as the tech company. We're not yes. going to let the state set the story, right? And like, just that's, wait that's until we're at the, sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. No, I, 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 I'm done. Okay. Um, I, I'm just thinking about when we get to the point where this kind of thing starts to become automated and algorithms are actually responsible for the comms portion of things as well. Because if, if we talk about efficiency and we talk about the layers of invisibility, it's algorithms that are really determining so much of what we can't see but are affecting the most minute things that we do and, and how we operate. Um, and I mean, I know there's a lot of history with Google around the table here, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the recent AI debacle, where that's going, the way that the company handled it, and what the implications are across the industry, because it, it, we are subject to more and more of these um, algorithms that we have no idea what kind of data has gone into them or what the implications are whatsoever. Do you honestly think we have no idea? I think we're getting to the point where there is so much data that's being inputted that we we don't. But I'd love to hear your thoughts because yeah, and the reason why I'm asking is I'm I'm thinking through this right because yeah. us saying algorithms are making these decisions, we're using algorithms to make these decisions. Like there's a yeah. there's a passive and active uh, way of like yes. being accountable, um, especially those of us who have worked in the technology sector. Particularly, I feel like need to come in on the active side because we're building this we're selling this you know where yeah. even if we're just critiquing it we're part of this system and i don't think that i think it goes back to the accelerant thing i think we've had problems before now they're kind of black box into this proprietorship which goes back to bianca's point about privatization right like we we are buying these out of the box things where our government, as an example, is told, you don't have to worry about this, you know, we'll take care right. of it. But inherent in that, that both parties understand, I don't know if at, at an individual level, it is clear, but but it inherent in that is also a shift in responsibility, right? If I don't hear about it, um, I'm, I feel like I'm not responsible to fix it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if people are calling in saying your, your, your new system is hard to access on my slow internet. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that gets filed when it goes to a private company versus a government whose job it is. You know, they've been elected to do this thing. So I, I, I'm not sure which of the AI debacles you're talking about because there have been many, but there are so many red herrings right now too yeah. uh, with this ethics and AI, and AI thing. And I know all of us have talked about that. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about the kind of space that you've um, curated for us today is to talk about, like actually bring it out of the ether and, and talk about how it looks and feels and mm -hmm. impacts us, you know, yeah. uh, on the everyday. I know uh, Bianca and I have had these conversations about, you know, we, we often kind of, even in the critique, get stuck in this um, abstract place. Yeah. And it's, Which is it's hard to pull back, right? I, I yeah, look well. at the way that algorithms, technology, these platforms are, are making decisions for people who live with very little money. And, you know, it'll be a random email that says, you were overpaid your old age security last month by $356. And they're like, what? Where did this come from? Now I'm out $356. And if somebody who is existing on $1,100 a month that is devastating. They, there's no accountability. There's no understanding of where that decision originated from. And that's a real world example of how somebody suddenly has to scramble to make life decisions based on something that happened that they have no control over whatsoever. Yeah. And the word that you just used, accountability, is tied directly to 
the older issue that I would say predates the internet, which is access to justice. Right. Right. And so this is it, is that access to justice has always been the problem for and a certain more segment of now people. Than it was. Right. That's and and in the AI world, like I'm not sure what this conference is called now, but it used to be called the FAT conference, which is fairness, accountability, and transparency. And the bulk of the work was on fairness, was so bias, right? Fairness and bias and transparency. The A, the accountability, is really the place to hone in on when you talk about democratic anything. Because at the end of the day, when there is a state, there is someone that has to be held responsible for a decision. And that's what's getting lost. In, and there's this slippage of access to the, to the decision maker, because now when things are being automated, it's like, well, who's the decision maker? The person who bought this thing? The person who wrote this code? Like, what is, how are we following this trail? And the problem with this is we know exactly who it was never accessing justice prior to the automation. So right. this is a calculated decision by the state and by the public service. And this, you can hear it in my voice. This is where I start to get really pissed off because there is a professional policy community of people who yeah. work in the academe, people who are policy experts, people who are legal experts, and they know damn well that this is the problem, but they are happy to sit around tables and like, let's, let's kick around the red herrings, right? But, yeah. but, but this is actually the problem. And it's really much more convenient when you get to look at your little piece of the problem. But I think ethically, if you know that is happening with these products, it is not ethical to focus in just on if there is a bias issue when the whole damn thing is a problem. Yeah. Right. And that's what I think expertise has mm -hmm. been wicked in this, this economy of experts around technology. This is, the, this is one of the problem spaces is that there's an entire economy of people, even critics, who are more than happy to hone in on, and I'll, I'll end on this point, and we saw this over and over again in all our years together of this. What was the topic everyone loved to talk about? Privacy. Sure, I don't have a background in privacy, but the tech companies love it when we're talking about privacy because now they are weaponizing that even against the governments and saying that gov you, you can't trust the governments, you gotta trust us. And, and what we're not doing is going at the right level of conversation, which is you're, they're taking over the government functions. These private companies are taking over government functions in education, in healthcare, in, in everything, in, in, in benefits, plan, like however those systems are being put together, whether it's a brand name or it's a consultant getting paid by the state. Yeah. So I think that's like when you talk about AI ethics and all the rest of it, I think it's, 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 uh, it's too small. It's a conveniently small lens. Yeah. And it allows a lot of people to pick the pieces that they want to look at, but access yeah. to justice, like that's it. It's like access to justice, access to justice. And this problem was older. You're so right. And I think, you know, one of the things that the tech industry has been seeking and, and a mantra, uh, the, the, the ethos of the industry over the past 15 years has been scale. And, and I really think we're reaching the point where it's got to become patently obvious to us that scale doesn't work scale of any kind the only thing that really works is to your point earlier relationships um, and and scale becomes something that starts to disintermediate it starts to obfuscate and and it starts to become uh, more complex than any benefit it actually offers and Sadia I'd love to hear your thoughts on that I know we've talked a little bit about relationships and how critical they are and how this gets a little bit um, disintermediated when mm -hmm. when we use technology to the, the extent that we do. Um, any thoughts on where that is or where that's going right now? As you both were, were speaking, I was thinking about growth. So when you say scale, it, it's very much this, the same thing, right? And people often um, hear these conversations that talk about slowing down and not growing at a pace that is unsustainable. And that too, I think is very removed from their everyday sort of reality, right? And there is yeah. an, what technology has in particularly, you know, um, in the last 20 years or so is it's atomized benefits, right? So when I'm assessing something, I'm looking at it as like me personally, is right. it convenient for me? Is it mm -hmm. good for me? Does it make something easy? Is it free for me? You know, like this is how I'm making decisions. And there's a whole host of things that we should be considering collectively, right? Which is a very different way of thinking, but we, we have sort of been robbed of that rhetoric 
you know, thinking collectively is for chumps. You, it's a dog eat dog world out there. You know, you, you got to watch out for yourself. All of these things, none of this is um, benign, you know, like this, we've, yeah. we've just absorbed this as a way of moving through the world. Um, and the growth part is like in service of what, right? So scale specifically, scale demands that we come up with a solution that fits as many people as possible, right? Which means that we are looking for these caricatures of people. This already takes us away from the relationship part, right? We are trying to standardize something, which is why we look to the binary, which changes how we look at this person sitting beside me on the subway mm -hmm. and this person who had a, a tent at Trinity Bellwoods. They are not like me in this world. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a distance that's created between us um, that makes it really, really hard because they are living that life. And if we're talking about narratives, I think about the stories we tell each other about why it's okay that certain people are living the way that they are while mm -hmm. we are living the way that we are, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and in the we, I will count people who are, you know, comfortable. Even then, I, the, there, there is a shift and a degradation in, in what we were supposed to expect from our lives together, you know? We have more old people now than we have ever, ever in the history of mankind, right? And we're not doing great in taking care of them, you know? The yeah. So there, there is an intergenerational sort of breakage in, in how we even talk about this. So when we talk about scale, I wanna bring it back, like th this is what we're thinking. I read this little random news clip about um, a New Brunswick town having built a 60 bed nursing home. It was a new nursing home, you know, and they had this big, um, big event as, as a way of like groundbreaking or whatever. And I was thinking right now, 60 beds, like, is that material? Like, what is that supposed to tell us about where we're heading when we're making such a fuss about this? And I'm not right. talking Total about, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, we're focused on the wrong things in this moment, which goes back to the relationship thing because relationships are hard because they take time, right? And they're not perfect and there's not a formula and you and I have to be around each other in order for that to happen. And everything around us that is accelerated by technology is taking us in some ways farther away, you know? Right. Um, I have lots of friends who are just online friends and I will probably never meet them and they're lovely. Um, yep. And they have made such a huge difference in my life. But mm -hmm. there is something about a life lived that way versus you know me running into my neighbors constantly. Yeah. You know, us sharing this space, very, very different. Yeah. Um, so the scale growth thing to me like kind of comes in, in here and um, how we think through these things, right? So it's not about just saying bad company, you know, big companies are bad, you know, like it's not just that. Um, we have to bring it back. And I think that's, there's no incentive to do that right now. Mm -hmm. Agreed. At least in the economy. Agreed. Um, it's a great segue to, we've got a question here from the audience. Let me just pick it up um, about grassroots movements. So what, what are ways that people can become more agile about using the tools that we have available to us for more democratic means. Um, and somebody mentioned the success um, or the initiative around Sidewalk Labs. Was there something specific that was done there that, that really helped to drive uh, that level of engagement? I don't know if anybody wants to yeah. take that one on, go for it. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things that's really, I think hopeful about this answer is, um, is that there's so much so much bad behavior and i would say small c corruption is being done in broad daylight mm -hmm. like governments are so used to this you know small number of people being highly engaged and a lot of people having kind of like that there's a sloppiness to the way yeah. the state is acting right now yeah. and so one of the things that was with sidewalk labs and i think for any initiative and this could be at a city provincial state any any level is you show up to your governments you don't have to say what they should be doing 
what the policy should be necessarily. And this is this is democracy on a, I'm talking about technology specifically. So what do we do about the way that technology is encroaching on democracy? And say, what are you doing about these things? What, asking questions is an incredibly powerful tool because you don't have to have the answer, but when you stare someone who they who knows that they are accountable for the outcome, and, and you can look at them and say, you don't have a policy for this. We don't have laws for this. You this, this, this law was written 10, 15 years ago, so what's going on? How are we managing these issues? You do that enough, and you get enough broad you know, acknowledgement there that there actually isn't a thing. That's one thing with technology. That is the opposite of so many issues where what needs to be done has been written down over and over and over and over and over again. So it's an interesting thing because on one hand with the tech stuff, sometimes you have to say, what exactly are you doing? We don't have, you know, X, Y, Z thought out for this with sidewalk. That was, that was a very important thing was to say, we don't have a digital infrastructure policy. You, you, who's setting the rules here? The, 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 the government, all three levels of government in Canada outsourced um, basically policy function to a private actor. No, no, no one said that was fine. That was why we started to show up. It was like this, <laughs> we don't have rules. They shouldn't be writing them. What's everybody doing here, you know? But so like that's, that's an example on the sidewalk side. Yeah. yeah, well, like there was nothing there. Now, the, the flip side of this, to be honest, in the like the growth between maybe 2017 and right now is policy, forget it, take the government to court. Right. Because policy, they can still do whatever they want, right? So, and I mean, this is, if we're going to talk about all the reports, the reports, all these dusty reports, 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 like it's no mystery what most of the bigger issues need. And mm -hmm. so how we show up at, at the street level, I think in those circumstances is in some ways it is really showing up like city hall, when you have yeah. lineups and lineups and lineups of people who can flood in we're and just keep deputing and deputing and deputing yeah. and just saying, we're here, we're here, we're here. Yeah. Um, but that's, I, you know, I, I think I'll stop at that point because I cannot say enough that the need to build out these stewardship commons alternative governance models is so mm -hmm. high simply because the corruption level that we're at right now with the professional actors from economists to, to management consultants to bureaucrats to companies yeah. it is software vendors like it is such a circuit of hell of corruption yeah. truly yeah. and that spending all blowing your time on like a policy discussion when really you know everybody's doing whatever they want anyways we i think this is this moment where we talk a lot about salvaging and it's like what of these democratic systems is there to salvage and that's why the courts make so much sense is because when you go to the courts our laws were set up so that they they needed constant time and friction like right. the, like laws it's only work when process. you show up and yeah. keep yeah like it's, it's a friction process and and here so this was an additional point, but so many even tech cases get settled before they go to court. Right. And that's a good example of like what happens when you have so much money and power that you can just like pay it off. It's like, you know, well, this is a cost of doing business. Right. We're going to do bad things and we're going to pay it and then we're not going to get called out, you know, going to hauled up in court. So right. I think um, I'll, I'll stop there in terms beyond the showing up, asking questions and like directing attention to what's wrong. I think there's also a need for us to organize differently around um, access to justice issues and getting more cases to courts. And I know well, that that's really hard, but it like finding I think there's more and more legal professionals who also can admit the law is a corrupt, you know, the law is a violent thing. It's n by no means perfect. Um, but I think we do have to go to the courts more than the last maybe 10, 15 years of, of work for like you can see who leads in going to the courts, right? right? Like yeah. when we're talking about, yeah, like justice, and, this is this is something more of us have to get our heads around, unfortunately, I think. Well, it, it's it's actually a kind of an amazing segue into something that um, we can't really talk about at the moment, but uh, we'll be able to shortly. So um, it, we there has been a realization that that is really the only route that we have left at our disposal anymore to hold people accountable. Um, and so there's a lot of work underway, some of which, uh, you know, we've had some broad discussions about um, around things like how do we inject, how do we make sure that, that people who are living in parks, their rights are actually preserved. The only way can, we can do that is through the legal system. Um, yeah, and, and I just want to do a really, a really short answer to why we all took this on with Sidewalk Labs was the government was outsourcing 
policy to a private actor and had not checked in with everyone about that and was doing that in broad daylight and the prime minister and Eric Schmidt standing there thinking, isn't everybody happy we're doing this? Mm -hmm. That's when, when you say doing stuff in broad daylight, not just doing it in broad daylight, expecting people to celebrate. Right. Right. Like that's why it was one of these things where it was like, this is not on, like, this is not on, you can't do this. You're packaging it. So it should just go. But, and again, been happening for decades, nothing special, but just want to make sure that this privatization, this responsibility of how a city works, moving it from a, a city council to a private company and thinking that that was a good idea. I mean, the mind boggles that that at 2017, that really people thought, oh yeah, that should be fine. Like this is, this was before the tech lashy stuff was in full force. Right. But um, the reason to say that so clearly too, is again, it's not like, these companies are trying to scare us that the governments can't do their job. And they're coming on hard and fast now saying the climate crisis is too big for you to manage yeah. these issues with education, all of them. Right. So let's yeah. just be real about they're trying to make us not believe in our own governments anymore. Yeah. And that's explicit. So mm -hmm. that's that's a big like ongoing problem. Any final comments? And they're not wrong. That's what makes it hard. <laughs> they're not wrong. No, they are not wrong. No. And it's pervasive at this point. So. Um, we've got a, I, just a few minutes. Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, th I think all of the things that both of you have said hearken to us changing our relationship with power, right? And power not in the, you know, uh, in the sky way. Power as in there, there is something. Leverage. Yeah, there, there's something about taking something to court that on a narrative level is very different than asking for permission, right? Which a lot of policy tries to do. Um, so I think that changing our relationship to that kind of power that we can use and we can do and trying to, it's as Bianca said, it's not easy and it's not cheap to do you know, to go this route. But all the other stuff that we're doing is also not easy and it's definitely not cheap. We were paying for this, you know? So mm -hmm. just in terms of how we go at this, I, I think just reigniting our imagination about how much we can do together and how powerful it is to, to be able to show up together. Yes. Um, anybody who's been to a good concert knows this feeling. There's something mm -hmm. about the energy of being with people you know, yes. to a good protest. And I say good as in like, you might not feel it in, in certain ways because they're not always safe, but you can feel the power of people being together. So coming out of this pandemic, I hope that we have, you know, more mm -hmm. appetite. Um, and it's going to be hard, right? Because of, of all, all of the checklists that we now have in our minds to, to actually remember that this is all we are meant to do, you know, this one life, but many lives together. Um, it's not necessarily even to finish the job, it is to do our part. Right. And that's really, really necessary to remember because it's very overwhelming right now with everything. Um, right. But we, we can't say no to doing our part and that will look like many different things. It's a beautiful way to wrap up, Sadia. Kat, I don't know if there's any other questions or if there's anything else that you want to say at this point to wrap up, but um, we are five minutes away from four and I think we're good. Hi, no, that was that was really um, inspiring. I was just wondering if we could have one comment for the, the viewers who may not know exactly what happened with Sidewalk Labs, um, but uh, just a little context for what was, what was at stake and what was it, was happening because um, over here on the West Coast, we're not completely up on Toronto everything all the time. Fair point. Um, basically, uh, Sidewalk Labs is a, a division. Correct me if I'm saying any of this incorrectly. <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm taking this, but um, Sidewalk Labs, uh, a division of Google, came in and said, We're going to take over. Uh, an area of the eastern waterfront known as Portland, starting with 12 hectares, and we're going to build the city of the future. Um, and it's going to have all of these things in it. And I think we were, there was a sense of bedazzlement by government until um, uh, Bianca and Sadia and people uh, started to take a look much more closely at what the implications of this were. 
and looked at things like, you know, the garbage disposal relationship with Actra that kind of was a, not Actra, I'm sorry, Astra, Astral Media that ended up going over to, to Bell Media. And those examples of private public partnerships that really did not end well. And um, it was a long drawn pitched out battle. And maybe I'll hand it over to you to finish it off at this point, uh, Bianca. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of um, tech will solve city problems. So let's just do this. And, and the other thing that was there and this, uh, this is the only other point and how it ended with Sidewalk saying, through a lot of different negotiations, they kept getting pushed into a smaller scope and this and that. And, you know, because the public was pushing back, there was a lot of pushback to their grand plans. And they eventually said, you know what, we can't make this work and it's a pandemic. So they said for reasons of the pandemic, they called it off. And so it never, you know, it never happened. But they also were showing up with a lot of money. And that was something that even the governments were saying was, well, we need money for infrastructure investments. We need this, we need that. And that's part of why there is this power dynamic with these companies mm -hmm. sitting on massive amounts of cash and yeah. governments thinking it's fine to like, you know, part, partner up with them, but then all these other consequences. So okay. at the end, all the public pushback and all the questions from every corner of, you know, different resident groups mattered because no one, no one, you, you could find every, every kind of, a, whether it was transportation, housing, whatever, there, there was, there was critique and pushback from mm -hmm. all corners. So, you know, it, it just it just didn't work out and they eventually said we can't make it work so we're out of here and i mean that that even unto itself a point study has made many times and i'll stop is just what a waste of time and attention when we have mm -hmm. pressing urgent needs residents would not have picked that as a priority and you know we we know what we needed we've <laughs> we we've known what we needed for decades and it's not computers it's money with so many of our issues in Canada. And I, I look at, I mean, I think what I was reading yesterday is just this idea of investments in schools in Northern Ontario, like all these things where we know what we need to do and we need to go hold the government accountable and say, put the money in, you know, put the money where it needs to go. That's our money. That's the thing we need to remember. It's not, we're the government in the in these democracies. We're the government, it's, it's our money and we need to say how we wanna spend it and it comes down to money. So money and power. Everything comes down to money and power. Um, actually, a lot of what you've just been saying, it sounds like we've got the thesis of both the first corporation film and the new corporation encapsulated in these issues quite lovely, in a lovely way. First of all, the, the lack of relationships um, that the messiness of democracy requires is the psychopath's charm. So they can charm us with their innovation and charm yes. us with charm yes. us with their bells and whistles. And and that's you know, that's just colonial capitalism yet again. Um, which is a ni nice segue to talking about uh, th th these issues, including including a, a deep critique of of big tech or what are in the new corporation. So um, that's a good segue to me talking about that little element of what we're hoping to do next. Um, which, if you've been to the any of the other webinars we've been going on about as well, which is we have the thousand screenings campaign. But before I talk about that, oh, there it is, <laughs> um, Sadia, did you have any last? thoughts before I, I disappear and give the closing remarks about this? I just hope that we can raise our expectations together for each other and for ourselves in, in terms of what is possible, you know, uh, not what is easy and, mm. and certainly not what is before us right now. So I, I think I echo the sentiments of everybody here and just saying that we deserve better and we should go demand it. Awesome. Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, stick around for the post chat chat and uh, I'll just go on with our last closing remarks around the thousand screenings campaign. So this discussion that we've just had, imagine if we had a thousand screenings with a thousand discussions happening around all of these important issues like climate, racial and economic justice, connecting the dots between colonialism, capitalism, and corporations. And imagine what digital organizing and digital democracy would look like if we had, we, if we the people had our say, a million engaged people all ready to take action. That's our vision and we hope you can join us. And you can find out how to join us on cool.world um, and also the new corporation.movie uh, around these screenings. And we're hoping to be launching very soon some big announcements as well as some actions and activities around these screenings, including some hosted by Tech Reset Canada, and uh, that will be coming up next. So once again, thank you for being here as part of our our project, our webinar today. 
Um, we would like to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts for our Salon series and this event. We would also like to warmly thank again our guests from Tech Reset Canada for the important work they do and for contributing their time and effort today. We would like to thank the team behind the scenes, Cool World founders uh, my, uh, besides me, <laughs> Lena Minifee and David Griffith, webinar series producer Melissa James and tech producers Darcy Hamilton and Cameron Lee, as well as digital marketing manager Jane Tattersall. So for more information about upcoming webinars, screenings, and how to become involved with our campaigns, go to cool.world slash join us, and we will be sending out a feedback form shortly. Please let us know what you've thought of today's event. So the next event is going to be in two weeks on July 15th. And it's a webinar called Legalize Compassion, Digital Curriculum for Harm Reduction Awareness, including a bevel up screening. This is co-presented with the NFB, the BC Nurses Union, and it's exploring the digital rebirth of the harm reduction documentary and digital teaching tool Bevel Up, which was created in 2007, when harm reduction work was still a rare thing in the healthcare world. I'm going to be moderating this discussion with former street nurse Caroline Brunt, who's now an instructor uh, at BCC, harm reduction activist Yasmin Windsor, and filmmaker Nettie Wild, with some more guests about to be confirmed. So this webinar will include an opportunity to watch the film on our community screening platform as well. And we hope also take some calls to action around the issues within it, around health equity and decriminalization and safe supply. Thank you everyone for joining us. And that is the end of today's webinar. Please join us at cool.world.